Okay, I just want to talk to a little bit about something that I also uh, played with and developed here, and that's the a derivative of the pivot point things. Uh, the pivot points are something that all the floor traders and all the exchanges know where they are. Uh, the way they're figured out is you take yesterday's range, um, you take the high, low, and close divided by three, and it gives you what's called the pivot point. So we're taking this price, this price, this price, dividing by three gets you that price. Then what we do to project the high pivot is take the difference between the low, the high, or the low, the pivot point projects the high, the high, the pivot point projects the low. Okay, all the floor traders know where those numbers are, believe me, okay, and all the exchanges. Right? And you'll find they, they, they bounce off them a lot. Now, if you've watched these numbers, and I know if, if people, you know, get your pivot points, you can program this on any software as well, you'll find they do bounce off, but how do you know when they're going to bounce off and when they're not? One of the ways to do it that I found works really well is to integrate time frames. So I look at this stuff, and I do it on a daily basis, but I also do it on a weekly and monthly basis. If you can get a projected low that's there for the, the weekly projected low, the monthly projected low, and the daily projected low, which doesn't happen that often, maybe happens, you know, I might see it a couple times a month, you know, in, in the 30 markets I follow, but almost always it bounces off there, okay? Almost always. Now, what we've done here, we want to take this pivot point concept a little further. There's a couple things, and this was covered in the last one, but I'll just go through it quickly. It's covered in that little booklet you have. The pivot point, which is the high plus low plus close divided by three, this is just a seven period moving average of it. Then what we did is we took the distance between the high pivot and the low pivot that we figured out, and we added it to the average to create a band, okay? And that band is usually pretty good support and resistance, especially in congestion. Once you get outside the band, um, uh, I generally don't use this technique anymore. But there's one better, that I, but this is all prelude to that. Okay. This, this center line here is just a 20 period moving average of the pivot points. Right? Now, and the top band, instead of being the difference between the first pivot low and the, and the, and the pivot high, okay, it's just double that distance added to the average. Okay? Uh, this, this, this trading band to me has the advantages of a Bollinger band and the advantages of a moving average channel band. Uh, the Bollinger bands can get kind of wild. If you've, if you've looked them out on your charts, they can get kind of wild, okay? But they adjust to market volatility, but maybe too much. Uh, moving average trading channel, which is, say, a moving average and then, you know, 3.5% above, 3.5% below, it's static all the time. So it doesn't adjust to market volatility. Because these bands are dependent on, on the, uh, you know, the volatility, the, uh, the trading range of the market, they do change. They do not change as fast as Bollinger Bands, but they at least adjust to the market volatility. Okay. Now, I think this one that I'm going to show you here today is better than the seven period. Again, this is a 20 period average of the pivots, and it's two times the difference between the high and low pivot added to the average. That's how I get the bands. Now, a couple of rules for trading this, and this is, a, this is a, I think, besides the square nine, this is really a good thing to, to look at. I don't think anyone's taught this before either. Well, I'm sure they haven't because I figured out the bands myself. Um, once we get two consecutive closes outside, outside of the band, that's, a, that's generally pretty a really strong market. Okay? Much more strong than two closes outside of those, the 10-day average of the highs and lows that we talked about before. And when that happens, almost always, or at least 75% of the time in my experience, when it comes back to the midline, it's going to rally again. Okay? Once you get a market that's strong enough to stay outside the band for a while, it comes back to the midline, it's going to go back in the direction it went in. Okay? You know, same thing here. It's strong enough to get outside the band, which is unusual. Once it comes back to the midline, it's usually going to go back in the direction of which it came. Yeah, most of my time frame is uh, two to three days, if I'm right, probably a couple hours if I get stopped out, <laughs> like silver.
Yeah, everything that I do is, is uh, you know, sometime even the next day, you know, I'll take it off. It's not, uh, it's, it's two to three days. I can't see any further along than that. Um, you know, here we are again, same thing. This is really a good indicator. I, just, I really do like this one. Um, once you get outside the channel, you know, if you're closing outside this channel, it's pretty strong. It's one of those 20% of the time when the market's really trending. And again, it comes back to the midline. Um, you can usually count on some sort of retracement. And when it's not closing outside the band, basically what I look at and say, well, if I get, you know, okay, we're closing outside the band, we're back in, we're up, we're up, but now hold on, now we're starting to, we're not getting outside now. We're getting to the band, we're not getting to the band. You know, we're here now, we, we held here, we held here. Okay, it's not trending anymore. Okay, it's now staying in the band, so it's not, it's now in the 80% of the time when it's not trending, not the 20% when it is, all right? And look how often these bands are pretty good support and resistance for the market. At those points, do you start going counter-trend? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at, at the very least, okay, they're, they're good profit-taking targets. Okay? At the very least, absolutely. Um, you know, our market letter, we were down here. Um, I really thought that was a low for other reasons. And, and I said it should get to at least 1,000 because that's about where the top of the band was then. Okay, and obviously it did. And that's what we wrote down here where it was 9, you know, 55. That's the 20 period center line. That's right. Okay, and then two times the, uh, the difference uh, for the top of the band. But it really does contain price much better than any other band that I've seen. Here's one other little trick that, that I like to use with it. Um, this is an oscillator, which is basically just a di difference between the closing price and the, and the, and the band, or the, the midline, I'm sorry. So each day, to, to calculate where this oscillator value is right here, each day you just take the difference between the moving average value and the close, moving average value and the close, moving average value and the close, and you plot it as an oscillator. Okay? Uh, the, the charts? Um, the description, how to construct the, uh, the bands are in the book book. Okay. Yes. Okay. And if you have any problems, my email address is there. My fax number is there. It's no problem at all. Um, so what, one of the other things that I like to look at here is if we've been going outside the band, we come up, we fail at it. And this time we come back down and, and it looks like we're holding the band and we've got divergence here. Okay. Oftentimes that means it's, it, it wants to hold that that bottom, okay? So you look for divergence, look for some evidence that it wants to hold the band. 